Hey, Karina. How are you? Hey, Candace. Oh, I'm doing really good. So How are you today? You, you've been busy. You've <laughs> yes, been very so busy. So catch us up. What's going on? Well, I've been spending the last couple of years working on this project in the algae omega-3 space, kind of refining and honing my approach because I simply don't have faith anymore that going to the oceans for nutrition is really the best solution. And I made a career of being in the omega-3 industry. So um, it's been a journey. Uh, we're here. We have the product out. I've even started the podcast you see in the background if you're watching on video, Nutrition Without Compromise, to um, feature health and nutrition without compromising planet Earth. So that's, I think, the one-two punch. I'm working with Orla Nutrition, a brand I helped to create, um, which is the world's most sustainable algae. When I was last on this show, I had to be really kind of vague about it <laughs> because the brand wasn't out yet. <laughs> so so that's it so far. I mean, that's, I, we that's could it. dig right into it. We can talk about so many things with this conversation. We can talk about launching a brand. We can talk about the way that you're doing what you're doing and how it's so different because I'm really excited about your product, actually. Um, I've been taking it for, I don't know, about a week now. And I actually really enjoy, I, I've never been a fan of taking omega-3s because they just taste terrible. <laughs> they taste terrible. Yeah, they do. And these don't. <laughs> <laughs> you so know, they, I, I worked for a long time for, I would say, the best tasting of the fish oils in the marketplace. But the reality is it's still fish. And you know what? Oils, they oxidize and they oxidize rather kind of rapidly. So even if you have them in a bottle on a shelf, they come from fish, they start to just have that tinge, you know, you take the pill, even if it's flavored, especially if you do what I do and, you know, down it with a cup of hot coffee, <laughs> then it will burp right back on you. And But what's really unique about what we're doing with Orla Nutrition is that First, it's from algae, so it's not from fish. There's no fish to it at all. We cut right past the middle fish and went to where the fish get their omega-3s from, and it's in the polar lipid form. And I know that this may sound a, a little, it's technological. It just has to be. It's just your body assimilates different forms of nutrients in different ways. And the polar lipid form of the fat is the most bioavailable. So this means that you take it by mouth, it gets into your stomach, and it almost immediately gets integrated into your cells because polar lipids is how these fats exist in your cell walls already and so it's just like ready packaged ready to go and so as opposed to being digested the way a traditional oil would be where you know it sits on the top of your gastric juices for a little bit and creates what's called aldehyde byproducts that's the fish burp that results from it that doesn't happen that's with gross. ours Ew. i know i know <laughs> I mean, even you say a word like aldehyde, people think formaldehyde, right? Like something that you would use to embalm somebody. And I mean, the leap isn't completely crazy because it is an aldehyde and it is a gas and that's what comes up on you. So even if it was a fresh fish oil and it didn't have that overly fishy taste or flavor, you'd have a little bit of that after effect just by the nature of how your body assimilates the fat. And so if you consume it in the polar lipid form, then you don't see that. And the reason that we're able to retain its polar lipid structure is because we're growing it in a controlled condition in the, this aquaculture plant house, as we call it, in Iceland, um, using a photobioreactor. We basically only show the algae what it needs to thrive. So the color spectrum of light, uh, which is blue and red together, making this beautiful fuchsia color no uv that was news to me i assumed that all these plants would need uv to grow it turns out no in fact uv burns algae which is part of the reason that when you try to grow it in an open pond environment sometimes you need to make sure the water is circulating extra so that the the algae can kind of filter up into the light and then down below so they don't get burned like you know picture yourself trying to rush to the shade so you don't get that sunburn same that sort would, of concept. The, that's probably the reason why pond scum is brown. And <laughs> it might be. And also the reason that um, it tends to start to have that kind of smell to it. You know, you think about pond scum. Well, that that is algae that is starting to decompose. 
And so what we do differently, because we don't have to worry about that, we're, we're only showing the algae what it needs to thrive. We're only giving it the nutrients it needs to thrive. It's not growing in an open pond. So we don't have to use things like pesticides or herbicides. We don't have to worry about other algae strains coming in with the rain or amoebas or water beetles that like to eat it. So we end up with something that is just so much more pristine, growing it in pristine algae um, in pristine waters from Iceland too. So the end product is both more concentrated than it would be if you're growing it in an open pond, because again, it's not getting diluted with these other things. You don't have any soil coming in. You don't have any contaminants in, of any way. And so it's clean. And then we essentially just concentrate it a little bit and you end up with the polar lipid structure retained. So the omegas can get to work in your body right where they're needed. And I got to tell you, you know, I've been in this world of omega-3s and research for more than 20 years now. The more I learn, the more I learn, I already knew even if I didn't know it. <laughs> it's almost like you have some knowledge that just comes from some divinity. It kind of ends up in your head. I had always thought, okay, if you consume an omega-3 in its basis form, like this polar lipid form, it would both be more bioavailable, it would get to work, it would help to quash inflammation more, it would help to support your heart health and your eyes and your everything better. I, I knew that, I just knew it, right? But I had always consumed before this point a relatively high dose of fish oil. And you know, there's some things that come with that. You can <laughs> get a little bit too oily of skin as one example, <laughs> um, have some breakouts a result from too much of something, right? It's a good thing, but too much of a good thing can kind of be a bad thing in some cases, right? Um, and so even taking just 200 to 400 milligrams of EPA and DHA from this polar lipid form, which is basically just take it as it's labeled, two soft gels, two tiny soft gels a day, I notice the benefit. And what's really interesting is I've looked at some newer research with um, this woman I met years ago at another conference. Her name is Melanie Plourd. She's a PhD researcher from Université de Sherbrooke in Quebec, Canada. And um, she has been studying the genetic relationship to absorption of lipids. And as it would turn out, people with an APOE4 genome type, it's an allele, it's, they're roughly 15% of the population, 15 to 20% are of this genome type, you're either having one representation or two representations. These individuals are more likely to develop Alzheimer's, they are more likely to develop dementia, are more likely to have heart disease than um, some other genome types. I have one representation, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. So it's personal, right? Well, she has been doing this research, which ultimately is pointing to the fact that polar lipids are much better absorbed in particular by even these people who have this APOE4 type. So they're less likely, therefore, to develop things like Alzheimer's if they consume a polar lipid. Okay, so I'm, I, I love DNA. I think it's so fascinating. So um, I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know that I was this type. I just took the... <laughs> 23 and me and test and they told me you know like, oh, yeah sometimes you find out things kinda, you don't want to know but just because you're <laughs> you've got the gene doesn't mean it's going to express itself that's right and this is what you know all the researchers essentially saying is it's you know you are what you eat in a way that old adage is absolutely true you set yourself up to succeed by constructing the right habits and you know the health that you're building 20 years from now starts you know, 10 years ago in reality. And so if you had bad habits 10 years ago, you might have to work extra hard today to ensure that that 20 year from now self is as healthy as it wants to be. Yeah. So We're farther away. I mean, that's, that's reality. <laughs> we okay. all live in, you know better. <laughs> so uh, let's, can we just clarify what a polar lipid is? Because when I first, I, I had to Google it. <laughs> when I first read it, I was like, does that mean it's a cold fat? <laughs> Or is it a is it a fat that only grows in the, in the Antarctic or the Arctic? <laughs> so, so what exactly yeah, does polar so, lipid mean? And how polar, is it different they're, than other they're lipids? So named, okay, so they ha they're so named because they have a polar head and um, a nonpolar tail. 
And I know this, okay, so you try to picture something. Um, it's like it's it's two tadpoles that are swimming in opposite directions, but their tails are touching. <laughs> That's what the lipid bilayer looks like. That's what the polar structure kind of looks like. And so this is how all of your cell membranes are constructed in your body. And the reason it's important is because it makes them both water soluble and fat soluble. So now so everybody listening is thinking about tad fats fat tadpoles. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to find with their a way tails to touching. Tell you. <laughs> but their heads are pointing the opposite direction, kind of, you know. But each of them has two tails, so, so it's they're like it's, they're like a battery. And, you yeah, know, when you know. put the positive and the negative, they match. And when you put the positive against the positive, they don't. So it's kind yeah. kind of like a battery, kind of like that too. But I mean, what makes it so critical is that you know your cell membranes. You traffic nutrients through your cells. You eliminate toxins through your cell walls. The, the cellular lipid bilayers have to be healthy in order for you to reach your best health. And so getting polar lipids into your diet helps to ensure this happens. And if you happen to have drawn that negative roulette card of the APOE4 allele, you're still assured that you're going to be able to get these powerful omega-3s, the EPA and DHA into your tissues, into your brain, into your eyes. Um, one of our earliest testimonials came in from this gentleman who lives in Arizona. Um, he said, you know, my, my partner is an optometrist. I have dry eyes. Everybody in Arizona essentially has dry eyes. He's been telling me forever to take an omega-3. I tried fish oil and it didn't work for me. So I just stopped taking it. I've taken your product for four days and my dry eyes are gone. And I'm like, wow right like wow this yeah. this is why i do what i do half the fat in your brain and eyes is specifically made up of dha you could be consuming flax oil and all, all these other omega-3s that are plant-based all day long and not build enough dha for your system to thrive yet if you take two soft gels of our dha product which has just 350 ish milligrams of epa and dha combined this guy had his dry eye complaints disappear now, dry eyes are uncomfortable. They can be painful, scratchy. They can make you see floaters. You can suffer from blurry vision. That doesn't actually mean that you have poor vision, but your vision gets blurry. It can affect night vision poorly. You start to see streaking and things like that. I mean, it's an uncomfortable thing to experience. And that something like a simple nutrient that your body was missing could solve that is incredible. And it's everything of why nutrition fascinates me and why I've stayed locked into this you know, career for 20 plus years now. I'll well, just when, leave it as plus. <laughs> when, your, when your pets get sick, the first thing your veterinarian does is change their food. Oh my gosh. And why don't we do that with people? Uh, Here's a pill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I have uh, chemotherapy related dry eyes and I'm going to start paying more attention to how they are. I, I, I've probably been taking the, the Orlo now for five days, maybe. So I'm going to, um, when I, when I've, Got a full month in. I'm going to reassess the way I feel. But I went to physical therapy today and they went through the pain. You're, you know, what hurts today? And I don't complain about this often, uh, but I'm going to physical therapy because I have c cancer related pain, you know? Oh, um, and my pain level was like, so we're going down the list. And I'm like, oh. And then I'm like, oh, wow. And because it was significantly lower today. And, and I did not correlate that that could be because of the, the Orlo. And it so, could be. So, so let's talk about this for a minute because I think, you know, I could sit here and start sounding like an infomercial, but I know the science. And so I want to talk to you about why your pain threshold could be different. So, you know, I can't say that omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. That's reserved for your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and your aspirin, your Advil, your ibuprofen, your, what is the technical word for Tylenol? I feel like I used to know it because I'm always looking at the generic kids version. No. Yeah, that might be it. That might be it. I don't know, honestly. A, um, yeah. Ibuprofen, acetaminophen. Yeah. So um, all of these things are anti-inflammatory drugs. They're over the counter. 
omega threes, it's a food and, and you can create supplements from them, but <clears throat> really you never had a deficiency of Tylenol. You never had a deficiency of Advil. What your body is lacking is the ability to push your inflammatory concerns back to normal. And so what happens in our body? We have anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and cytokines, okay? We've heard a lot about cytokines because of the cytokine storm that so many Americans experienced when they got confronted with COVID, right? And this resulted in out of control inflammation in their systems. Essentially, their immune systems attacking their own bodies to try and rid itself of this awful sickness, right? That, that really should just be a really bad flu or cold. Like we should be able to get through this thing. But it's killing people. And a good portion of the reason that many doctors and those that are nutritionally aware think that this has become a problem is because our lifestyles and our diets have been pro-inflammatory, meaning we have a lot of stress. We have both parents working full time plus plus, running your kids to daycare, doing all the stuff. I'm living in that reality as you know, an old mom of young ones because I was a geriatric mother too, right? So, um, so we have all of these things confronting us, insulting our diets by consuming seed oils. And you might have heard negative things about seed oils. We're talking about corn oil, safflower oil, soybean oil. Um, basically all of the oils that are used in your baked goods and your fried foods. And these particular ingredients are used in basically everything that's packaged that you go to consume. Um, you can throw trans fats into the bucket too, right? Partially or fully hydrogenated oils. They're all, all of them pro-inflammatory. You think you're doing something healthy for you. You go and get a salad, like the one pictured on the green screen behind me, right? Um, you, you pick up a salad dressing. It says it's made with olive oil or avocado oil. You're like, great, that's a healthy fat, right? I'm going to go ahead and consume that instead. Well, guess what? While that oil is not inflammatory, in fact, it's a healthy fat, avocado oil and, and olive oil, both healthy fats. It's only one ingredient in that salad dressing. And if you look at the first ingredient in that salad dressing, it's likely to say soybean oil or corn oil or canola oil. And so what you're doing is you're giving yourself this pro-inflammatory set of fats and none of the omega-3, none of the anti-inflammatory fats. We don't consume enough plant-sourced omega-3s to ever make up for that. And then, so unless you're consuming oily fish two to three times a week. And I'm talking about the low on the food chain ones, sardines, anchovies, mackerel, low on the food chain, high in omega-3s, lower in mercury, lower in dioxins, pesticides, furans, all these other things that are in our ocean waters. They're still present because they live in our oceans and guess what? Our oceans are polluted. So unless you're doing that two to three times a week, your body is under an inflammatory assault. So how do you solve that? How do you solve that, especially if you're a vegetarian and you don't want to consume fish? Well, you need to address your diet. You need to reduce your consumption of omega-6s, start making more foods at home. Whole foods make a difference, right? And that's not overly processed whole foods. That's like cooking in your kitchen. Um, and also at the same time, add more omega-3s. And the best way to do that is with an algae oil. And so I could point to any brand out there. I prefer ours, of course, and getting it in the polar lipid form, but really just make sure you're getting a direct source of EPA and DHA. You can do that through algae oil. You can do it through fish oil too. I'm a fan of algae because um, it reproduces very quickly. You can grow it quickly. And I love that you are farming it in this state-of-the-art farming facility. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's so high tech. I mean... I mentioned briefly growing algae in open ponds. I mean, that's doable, that's scalable. Another method of growing algae is actually by fermentation in vats. It looks like, you know, it look, could look like any manufacturing facility, right? You go to a warehouse style uh, manufacturing facility that has like these um, stainless steel, big containers. I think most people can picture it, especially if you've ever watched something on um, YouTube, like how it's made. <laughs> 
<laughs> they'll go behind the scenes and show you food manufacturing. So it could be made in that way in these vats, or it could be done the way we're doing it, which is using photosynthesis, like we're growing the algae with light and also feeding it just the key nutrients it needs. Um, so what we're doing is like putting what's completely natural on a hyperdrive. When you grow algae in one of these kind of more foody ways where it's like in a vat um, that looks like stainless steel, not exposed to light at all, you're typically feeding it a truckload of sugar, right? So you would take what, whatever you're getting that sugar from, it could be sugar cane, it could be beets, it could be whatever, but you have to feed it sugar to grow it by fermentation. And so that's the way most of the algae oils out there are produced. And um, typically what's grown is a high DHA omega-3. Now, you're you're making that algae with light because the light first grew the sugar cane or the beets or whatever and now you have that sugar and you're feeding it to them or you can cut that out entirely too and do it the way we are which is purely just using light but without having to worry about the open ponds and um, so i would invite people to take a look at um, our website, orlonutrition.com. They can actually see some um, the photobioreactor, which um, it's like a vertical farming approach to the growth of um, these algae. But in these um, arrays where you see the lights on either side of the tubes, um, so it's this fuchsia color, and we're just using water, light, and a few core nutrients, you know, the typical that you would feed a plant like um in nitrogen phosphorus etc right just feeding it the few key nutrients that it needs no pesticides no fungicides no herbicides no any of that other stuff that you have to worry about and also no sugar it's creating its own sugar it creates its own omega-3s it creates its own proteins all by feeding it light and just a few key nutrients well and, and i can't imagine that the, the one of the major benefits of algae is that it cleans this it scrubs the air i mean it it takes in the carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. I'm so uh, glad you said that. This is why it's important that we grow it photosynthetically because yeah. now there's not a carbon cost to it, right? It's actually creating oxygen as a byproduct. It's consuming carbon. And so our plant is co-located in Iceland with a geothermal plant. This is why the energy that we're using is all 100% green energy. And we're even taking their waste stream CO2 and feeding it to the algae. We essentially bubble the CO2 through the tubes because it obviously needs to consume the CO2 in order to produce oxygen and it's, it's food for it. It's the way oxygen is food for us. It needs the CO2. Um, so we bubble that through. Those bubbles act a little bit like scrubbing bubbles. They keep the glass that's on the inside of each of the tubes clean um, so that the light can continue to shine on and ultimately produce the most potent algae possible. And the algae itself doubles its weight every two days. And so by optimizing its growing conditions, each two days, you can just kind of continue to siphon out a little bit and go ahead and, um, you know, run through concentration processes in this continual fashion. So your growth cycle can be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all days of the year, because guess what? That geothermal plant runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all days of the year. So the algae grows. This is amazing. Um, cause algae, you also said protein. Algae does have protein. Um, yes. it's a great food source and there are cultures who've eaten it for, you know, there are cultures who eat algae. Um, um, so the, the fact that you can produce energy and a food source at the same time, that's mm -hmm. phenomenal. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about the algae growing and the way we're growing it. Um, is that we see the more bioavailable forms of constituents in the self. And so we don't just grow algae for omega-3. We also grow a spirulina. Spirulina is commonly known as a blue-green algae, right? And that's, you know, typically comes from lakes um, growing where people will go ahead and harvest it. There's actually a grower also on Hawaii on the Big Island who does the same thing, growing it in open ponds, we grow our algae in this photobioreactor. And that specific spirulina, it has something completely unique about it. And we, it was a surprise to us too, because 
we knew that spirulina has vitamin B12 in this precursor state in open ponds. What we didn't know is that by converting its growing technology or how we grow it to in these tubes, that it would create vitamin B12 in its most bioavailable form. So it's actually in the methylcholamine form. This is the product we're now using um, in our immunity boost because spirulina is very powerful as it has antiviral capabilities, antioxidative capabilities. It also has key nutrients that vegans are often deficient in, including that B12 in its most bioavailable form. And so we're producing the immunity boost alongside our omega-3s. Spirulina doesn't really create omega-3s, so that's not the strain we use for that. Um, but we've created the immunity boost to have vitamin D3 in its most bioavailable form and a water soluble form, in fact, which is unique. Um, B vitamins and a scattering of B vitamins beyond the B12 and then the spirulina, just in an oral spray, you spray it in your mouth, hold it in your mouth for a little bit and then swallow. I don't so, know. Did you get that one too? I do. I have I it right I here. Sent that to you. I have it right Good. here. Yay. Um, <laughs> and I, it's, um, it's, it's a little different. But it's not bad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not bad. Um, so I think it's a little sweet for my palate, but I'm the one who's asking people to make me a margarita and leave out all the syrup, you know? So Maybe that's <laughs> the weird, because I, when I first tried it, I was like, what is that? It's not bad. What is that, though? So maybe it was because so it was two sweet. two things, because yeah. the spirulina itself is... Um, not really have any flavor to it, which is quite interesting. Most of the spirulina that you find um, out there is kind of a greeny flavor to it. Our um, spirulina is so blue. Like if you spray that spray on a um, piece of paper, it just looks bright blue, right? <laughs> that we're actually making a food colorant from it. And it it's um, so innocuous that you can, you know, color your frosting with it when it's without the other ingredients and it doesn't even have a real flavor to it. But B vitamins, B vitamins have quite a flavor. <laughs> and so I've formulated with B, B vitamins for a long time. Um, and it's something that's challenging to mask. Um, often people use citrus or mint as masking agents. We didn't do either of those. So um, what you'll hear from people is, oh, it has kind of like a nutty flavor or something like that. That's really the B vitamins talking to you. Um, and then it's um, actually got some sweetness in there from sorbitol, but the sorbitol also asks, acts as a preservative and it's very capable of keeping the product free of any bacterial growth for its full one year shelf life. So it's kind of a required ingredient in there at the same time. So it's perhaps a little bit more information than people need to hear, <laughs> but it's the reasoning behind it. And um, I personally just love the product because of the fact that I know the science behind the spirulina that's in it, how much more bioavailable it is and how protective it is of my lung health in this post pandemic world that we're in. Well, we should all be paying more attention to our health um, and giving our bodies what it, what it needs to stay healthy. Okay. I want to talk about launching a business. Oh boy. Cause you launched. <laughs> yeah. So take us through what, th what that's like. Well, uh, there are so many moments of consideration that sit in the background as you're building anything. Um, when it comes to a brand, when it comes to how you'll come to market, when it comes to how long it will take to manufacture it and what types of, you know, in the case of something that's a consumer product and when you consume, what types of stability tests you have to run? You know, how many things do you have to kind of put in the pipeline and make sure it all comes through in a seamless way at a specific point in time? We did run into a few snags. There's always a snag or two. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that having the faith of the team at Vaxa Technologies, who is our parent company, um, they came in and said to me, you know, yeah, we want to do this and we want to do it right. And I've heard that many times from many different leaders and many different companies and then had my dreams of what the product could be whittled away as you make concessions around the cost of the packaging or, oh, well, you know, I, I understand this idea of wanting to go black and white with a branding, but what about a splash of color <laughs> and just continual kind of interruptions like that um, 
what I will say is that the team, they put their faith in, in me and in building the brand and they listened, which was really incredible. <clears throat> so I think sometimes it's just really important to acknowledge that dependent on what your dreams are around a project, you, you really have to get clear with your reason for each of those dreams. <clears throat> you have to, at the same time, be ready to defend them. And also, as my husband would say to me, um, as he said to me this morning, be willing to bend like a willow when it doesn't, when it's something that doesn't matter, right? Like stand your ground when it counts and then, okay, this doesn't matter. Let it drift. We'll, we'll move forward. Um, and I feel like I, I got what I wanted out of the brand. I mean, I came to the table saying I'm a greenie at heart. I'm probably a dark green, if you know what that means. Um, but I care about sustainability. I care about social impact. I care about wanting to make sure that people are treated fairly at every step of the way. <clears throat> so when I came and I said, I want to do something different. I want to showcase how algae can be cool and do it in a way that tells a story at every moment. I want to be able to lean into this black and white world or this monochromatic world with a brand because I know that I can get a black ink that is from algae. I can't get any other color of ink, but I can get a black ink. And so if I can get a black ink and I can build this simplistic looking brand and simplistic in look, but not simplistic in message and not simplistic in, you know, it's overall look and feel, but it does have this kind of austere, um, clean, minimalist kind of perspective to it. But that also comes through in the waste. Like we're not creating a lot of waste. We're taking something that would be a petrochemical, like ink is typically petrochemical. Some of them are from soy, but you know, then you have problems of soy and I, I don't even need to get into that. But um, this one in particular is taken from waste stream algae. So it's a waste product that's turned into an ink that we then print on our t-shirts and we print it on our post-consumer, 100% post-consumer recycled packaging. So, you know, yes, it, it doesn't look like black and white. I said black and white, but it's, you know, monochromatic. Um, we're able to showcase the ability for us to think a little differently about how we construct a consumer product, put it in a glass bottle that is completely recyclable and also recycled already. I mean, most glass that lives out there has been in another glass form before and will be in another glass form again. And the same thing with our plastic materials going to post-consumer recycled and then ensuring it's still recyclable so it can live yet another life. Um, you know, I would, I wanted to go to compostable packaging, but everybody at the, um, this is one concession one concession I had to make, right? I wanted to not do any plastic. Um, but the challenge there is that plastic is incredibly good at preserving the life of a product. So if you know that you want a two year shelf life, the pouches that refill our glass bottles are made of post-consumer recycled plastic with just one layer of laminate virgin plastic to protect the soft gels. This is a food grade requirement, right? Um, and then this pouch itself is also made of a minimal amount of plastic, far less than you would typically get from going and buying a supplement bottle from the shelf, right? So all of those things are less, but if I had gone compostable, the shelf life wouldn't hold, um, the stability tests that we would run on the product would show that there was some degradation. And instead, because we've gone to this reflective material, no light is getting in, it's not oxidizing, you know, the soft gels themselves are actually made of algae too. So again, full circle, thinking about the whole picture, we're making algae cool, we're showcasing what can be done differently. From the product perspective, I'm 100% confident that we can stay behind the statement we make, which is this is the world's most sustainable omega-3 and the world's most sustainable algae product. Um, that being said, there are so many moving pieces on the chessboard that you have to pay attention to. And this goes from your partners who are going to manage your social media to, you know, how are you going to access the market and 
what tools you're going to put in place when and when are you going to need to ask for help and put other soldiers on the front line with you um right now i'm in some ways a solo operation i have partners that work with me i was able to select um, an all-female design firm in san francisco to help us bring this brand into its existence i was able to locate a fulfillment partner out of texas which is centrally located in the country so product could get from there via ground shipping to each coast within five days you know travel during high season so that means people get product quickly preferentially only shipping ground i mean we we can ship air but the way i priced it even is like i mean people aren't going to pay to ship it air <laughs> so you think through all these things to make it resonate with the brand um and to every step of the way, hopefully identify those people that believe what you believe, that care about things the way you care about them, so that so that it feels like a journey together and not a struggle, even when, you know, building anything. It, it, it takes time and it can feel like a struggle at times. So the partnerships, um, the people who come from that center of belief first, that we can do things differently and that we care about what we're doing. Um, I mean, that's that's really, I think, been the guiding force that has helped me get to the point we're at now, which is finally launched on Amazon. We also sell on our own brand page, um, you know, across the thousand follower threshold on Instagram. And we're still building that day by day organically. We're not doing any of the paid farms or the bot farms to just inflate our numbers or anything like that. But um, we're taking one step at a time. Well, your husband is right. Bend like a willow. Because willow trees are the most beautiful trees. Yeah, well, he actually wrote it on a note for me today. He had to leave early. <laughs> <laughs> so it was top of mind. Um, one day a week, he has to drive like more than an hour away. So he leaves before dawn. And I am solo in the house getting the kids together and doing all that stuff. And he left us each a note. And this time, they all sounded like they were sayings by Confucius. You know? <laughs> Or, or taken from the art of war, maybe. He's like, you are strong, like, you know, you are, I admire on you your strength, but you need to remember sometimes to bend like a willow. <laughs> it's the willow in the, um, in a storm, the willows that, that's branches do not break. I think willows make good um, bows, bows that be a bow and arrow, a bending. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, but willow trees are gorgeous. So, um, I think that they're, they're gorgeous because they're so adaptable. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. They I just are, think I just, they? I, if I see a willow tree from the distance, I'm like, Oh, so because, well, first of all, they're rare. You don't see them very much anymore. Um, but I just think, yeah, so well, I think, um, how I picture them always is right by a pond, right? Like they're mm -hmm. always by a pond. They provide shade and you can just, and they're huge and sh sit they under shelter, their, you shelter sit under their branches. Mm -hmm. They make yeah. you feel. I remember them being really fun to climb as a kid too. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think I've ever climbed a anyway. willow. I don't think I've ever climbed a willow. I've climbed plenty of oak trees though. I'm from Central California. Oh. I have climbed oak trees <laughs> 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 all everywhere. over the place. <laughs> yeah, people have different visions of California. They think um, when they don't come from here, they think about. Um, they might think about redwoods. They might if they've really been to Northern California, but usually it's beaches and Baywatch, right? <laughs> <laughs> not, not not that part of the not not that part of California. I'm not from that part of California. Yeah. I'm from the place. Yeah, I mean, Los Angeles is so far different. I'm up in Santa Cruz County, and so. Um, the world here is ocean and redwoods and rolling hills. And just off the edge of my deck is the oak trees that you're talking about, like mm -hmm. chaparral on one side, and then I have redwoods on the other. So mm -hmm. it's a very interesting spot to live and one that's full of wildlife, coyote and, you know, red-tailed hawks and barn owls and stuff like that. And I'm from the other side of the bay from you, Monterey, or Castroville. Mm -hmm. you, you'll probably know what Castroville is. Yeah. So lots and lots of lettuce and artichokes and spinach and hills and oak trees yeah <laughs> lots and trees. lots of oak trees we do have beaches but it's not it's not the way that people think right well the the, the coastline there is one of the most beautiful that i think exists you know from pacific grove to atascadero and mm -hmm. carmel mm -hmm. it's just incredible i'm a scuba diver so i, I really like 
that part oh, of the I'm world. I'm sure. I am yeah. sure. Yeah. It's not that far away, though. It's like a 45 minute drive. I'm sure you scuba dive a lot. Not much these days when you have a five year old and an eight year old. When will they be old enough to, to scuba? I think you have to be 10 to get your scuba diving certificate. I want to say it's like eight or nine, but that okay. still feels too young to me because you have to learn um, to quiet the panic within when you're learning to breathe underwater. And I just don't see that as something that an eight year old is really good at. Maybe a girl. I don't know. I have only boys. I don't know. But there is some panic. There is some, yeah. there's this moment when you're learning to breathe underwater because it goes against everything that you understand to be true and right with the world. It's like, okay, you know, it's compressed air. So it's kind of drying and it's got some challenges, but I mean, I love it. So I'll teach you one day. So is there any, what, what, what message do you have for the audience? What do you want the audience to know? I want for everyone listening to understand that you can have great nutrition without compromising your ethics or your morals, that it's possible to balance your fats without giving up all of your favorite things in the world. Um, you know, first you can just consider maybe consuming less of the things like the fried foods and the ho-hos and the Twinkies and the Krispy Kremes. Doesn't mean you can't have them as a treat. Um, but really consider whether you're getting enough omega-3. Um, 99.9% of Americans are not. <laughs> I can confidently say that. And the average individual is consuming 16 times more omega-6s than omega-3s. So we should be closer to that one-to-one. -one. You'll get closer to optimal health when you are. And you'll find that simple things like forgetting where you put your keys, or maybe you have slightly fuzzy vision, or you might have that ankle that's just bothers you in the morning. Those sorts of things can be something of the past, and it doesn't have to feel like it's a giant effort if you just address a couple things with your diet and consume more omegas. Excellent. All right, since you've launched a business recently, share what your favorite marketing tool has been to launch the business. Oh gosh, my favorite marketing tool podcasting. I think that's probably my favorite across the board. I've had the opportunity to go on a couple of shows I really love, including this one, um, and also um, connect with some amazing individuals. There's one I got to guest on called A Sustainable Mind with Marjorie Alexander. I've loved her podcast for a long time. I got to be episode 99. Um, so that was really fun. And it's just been such an incredible thing to be able to connect with old friends in the Omega-3 space, invite them on the show, talk about their most recent research and geek out about it. And then to learn on the side that, you know, I inspired someone to change their diet just a little bit. And whether or not they're consuming the Omega-3s that we produce at Orlo, that just, you know, really keeps me going. It makes me feel like I'm making a difference. So I think that's that. Well, I really hope that folks understand that the true story here is that you've got a power plant next to a food source and the power plant is creating, is, is basically creating the food and the food, you know, it's that the circle, I mean, that is the future and it makes me, I'm excited about that. I'm excited yeah, to see well, more of that in the world. Dr. Isaac Burzen, who is one of our founders, he worked with NASA to work on growing technologies for, for growing algae in space. And some of that technology is what we're using now. So when I watch The Expanse with my husband and I see, uh, and this is a sci-fi show on Amazon Prime. It's our, my, my husband and I, we, we read the books, we watch the show. Yeah, yeah it's our favorite, yeah. <laughs> it's our favorite. We listen to the audio books, yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I watch that show and whenever they're showing like uh, the growing conditions for just growing plants and these kind of circular lights and things, I'm thinking, you know, this all could be reality in the next generation. We mm -hmm. could be off planet and, you know, consuming our chow mm -hmm. <laughs> with algae based proteins and omegas in them. So, I mean, that's in the future. Well, everything, I mean, they call it the scrubbers, but they're, they just, have plants everywhere and the plants are absorbing the carbon dioxide and and pushing out the oxygen and um i the last time i took a biology class was 
30 years ago, so I'm not going to say the right words. But <laughs> but it really is. I mean, in order to live on these ships, you need to have oxygen. And they use plants to produce the oxygen on the ships on this sci-fi show, which really is That's the right. way it's going to work. Yeah. You know? they, they, they consume carbon dioxide. And from light, they make nutrition. I mean, it's just so cool. I mean, uh, Isaac Burzen, who I just briefly mentioned, he's one of the co-founders he was mit schooled he put it simply as we consume light and as you go closer and closer to the source the loss is less so if we're consuming something like algae then we're not having to consume the thing that ate the thing that ate the thing that ate the thing that every step away there was some loss and it was a cost to create that thing so we can get more from less and sustain humanity while also being part of the climate solution which is next level in my humble opinion it would be nice to see us return to a world where we don't have out of control storms and wildfires you know raking our coastlines yeah well i think that this this technology that you guys are using is brilliant and i hope that we start doing it here in the u.s (laughs) <laughs> it's probably going to take 50 years, but maybe, maybe one day. Well, one well, I really appreciate that you've been here and that we've been, we've had an opportunity to talk about two of my favorite things, which are podcasting and sci-fi. So, <laughs> and I knew I liked you before, but now that I know that you watch The Expanse, I like you even more. <laughs> well, last night I caught my husband watching it again because we got a new used TV. Like one of his friends was getting rid of theirs because it was too big for their next space. And he said, I'll take that. And so he's like, I want to watch it on the new high def TV. <laughs> we started from the beginning is watching it again. Which you can do because when you watch it again, there's things that you missed the first time because it is so well done. Yeah, it there's really so well few done. shows that are that well done. I agree. So few shows that are done like that. And the books are even better. There's a lot of yeah. differences between the TV show and the books. The books are better, but um, but they stayed very true to some of the things too. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Anyway, so don't we have a special offer for the for the listeners? Well, yes. In the spirit of gratitude, um, I'd like to offer all listeners an extra ten percent off their order if they want to peruse our site at Orlo Nutrition, and they can get an extra ten percent off that first order. Presently, we're running a promotion where we provide both the immunity boost and the omega-3 of your choice at an all-in discount of 27% off. And so this coupon would stack with that. You could theoretically get the equivalent of 37% off your order and also free shipping. So that's not something we typically do at orders under $100, but this would be an order under 100. So it's um, the most affordable way to try both products. And I hope people will give it a shot. Gratitude 10. Awesome. Gratitude 10. The, and plus links will be in the show notes. But I have been using both the Immunity Boost and the uh, Omega-3 at the time of recording for a little less than a week. And I can feel it. So you know what? When the show actually drops, it will have been maybe three weeks. So I will put in the show notes an update on how my body feels. So check oh, wow. the show notes for an update I'll check of how notes. my body feels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Favorite part of the show? To your moment of gratitude, for whom or what are you most grateful? Well, the last time I came on, I said I was most grateful for my body because I was able to get through all the rigors of my life. And um, I think while that still rings true, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for parenthood. <laughs> as much as it's um, posed unique challenges that I, I never really thought that I would confront, I find that I am able to take steps back and really indulge in my creative self in a way that I hadn't for a very long time because I'm having to think about what was, what it was like to be five and what it was like to be eight and kind of inspire parenting through that kind of creative self that comes from someone who I might have forgotten (laughs) in my, in my own self, like forgetting who you were at those moments. So I feel like parenting is now teaching me to know myself in new ways again, or to get back to what's truly me. So I love that. 